here we go. Nicole, thank you so right. much for joining us and being part of this Analog Astronaut Conference. Yeah, my pleasure to be here, Beth. And I wish I wish I could be there like in the hugging proximity, but you are. this will work. This will work. <laughs> well, here's the ultimate question to kick us off as an artist and as an astronaut. I don't know if you've ever been asked this question before. So here we go. Is it the meatball or oh the worm? <laughs> You know, it's funny because I, I actually have a kind of an affinity for both because when I started at NASA at the Kennedy Space Center in the late 80s, it was the worm at that yes. point, right? Yes, so good. At, right? Classic. Yeah, I know. I, I love it. I love I, mean, I do. I love it. And then uh, while I was there, I believe it was Dan Golden, who was the administrator who laid down the law, you know, thou shalt change every logo <laughs> that we have to, you know, back to the meatball. Yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> and I don't dislike, I mean, I like it. I, I really, I like both of them. They each have kind of a, an artistic, um, you know, one has like this simplicity that I think is just iconically recognized. Right. Right. And then the other goes a little bit more, um, I, I don't know, just a little bit more uh, graphically yeah, yeah. Um, interesting, right? And and is recognized. But I don't know that I have a preference for one or the other. And I can tell you, I mean, a lot of work was done when that transition was made, you know, when the law was laid down. I mean, everything from letterhead to the signage on the vertical assembly building right. to tails of airplanes, all of it was transitioned to the meatball. And now I like that we've got kind of a little hybrid going on where there's not, it's not against the law to have the meatball, but you can yes. have the, and I should have worn my shirt today from STS-133. Um, we were, when we first were assigned to STS-133, which ended up being the final flight of the space shuttle discovery, mm -hmm. we were assigned as the final flight of the space shuttle program. And then, you know, things happened and we very fortunately got another flight and added to the manifest. And then those guys on 134 slipped, you know, past us. So, you know, we didn't end up being the final flight, but we thought, man, we need to go a little bit retro on this. Right. And at that point, it was still a little bit verboten to use the worm, <laughs> but we did it. We made some of our crew shirts were blue with this white worm on it and then STS 133 under, nice. under the bottom. And you would not believe how many times we'd have people looking at us like, how could what you? Do, what doesn't look right about them? <laughs> and then we'd get the question, are you allowed to wear that shirt? And we're like, well, apparently we are, because we are. <laughs> it's great. Anyway. Ask for forgiveness, rambling. <laughs> right? No forgiveness yeah. instead of permission. Isn't that the quote? Oh, right. And, uh, and, and we did a picture. We did this photo shoot with uh, Bob Crippen and John Young. And they had, I, I really think I remember them having mission shirts on that had the worm and we had our worm ones on too. It was really. Oh, I'd love so to we, see we that. Proved photo. it out right then. I'll see if I can find it. That sounds good. That <laughs> sounds good. Well, yeah. we are so glad that you could join us because we are all coming together to celebrate the achievements and also to collaborate on our work as analog astronauts. And what advice would you have for us as we gather together that we can carry through us perhaps throughout our time here? Wow. I think, you know, I was thinking about this a little bit and not because I hadn't heard your question before, but not, you know, directly with respect to that, but just in terms of, you know, what is kind of the underlying common theme, whether it has to do with, you know, analog astronaut, um, astronauts flying on spaceships, or really like our role here, right here as crewmates. I mean, if we accept it on spaceship Earth, right? And I think the advice first off would be in, in any of these analog scenarios, right? Um, ultimately you're, you're working and you're developing the, not just the skills, but the equipment, right? And using it to survive in an environment that is extreme in some way, right? It's all ends up being about life support somehow. Can't walk out the door without special equipment on. Um, the way you grow or um, eat or use food, how you live together in a relatively confined space, <clears throat> all of those things are ultimately about survival, 
yeah. you know, yeah. and then figuring out in that place, um, how do you thrive there as well? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the same thing we're doing on a spaceship in space. Um, analog missions right here on earth. And we do those as part of astronaut training as well. Right? right. And then, and then taking that with us to our daily lives right here on spaceship earth, you know, how all of those things weave together. And uh, one of the things I love about the way I've at least seen uh, these analog missions play out is that there is always a, uh, like a mission definition, there's uh, experiments that make sense for um, what you'd be looking at and how you're living there. There's communication uh, guidelines that are in place for how you're going to operate in that environment. There's the safety and security kinds of things for, you know, between each other as crew members, and then how you're going to look out for each other when you're out on an excursion, you know, in a spacesuit walking around in you know, in a, an extreme deadly environment and all of those things. Um, I think that's what we need to be keeping in mind when we're, um, whether we're doing an analog astronaut mission, uh, whether we're in space on a spaceship or whether we're here on spaceship earth um, in this place that is designed for us to survive. How do we take that to the next step and look at what we need to do to thrive in those places as well? Yeah, if that makes sense. Oh, of course. And speaking of one of the places, I've been dying to ask you, what was it like living under the water? You know, um, that was absolutely. And when I think about uh, analogs to flying in space, it is absolutely the best. And oh, really? for, yeah, for so many reasons, um, everything from psychologically to the way the mission tasking plays out the relatively confined space, but ultimately about it being really and truly being in an extreme environment, right? right? So we use the Aquarius undersea habitat off the coast of Key Largo, school bus sized hab that sits at, I think it's about 60 feet, you know, down on the ocean floor. And it's, um, the pressure in that hab is equal to that 60 foot depth pressure, right? So you get down there and you're there for more than an hour. Your body is saturated with nitrogen. You can't just swim safely to, to the surface to escape something going on, or even just, oh, I just want to go home now, right? <laughs> you can't do it because you're likely to to kill yourself mm -hmm. if you do that, to, to just swim to the surface. So you have to learn how for yourself and with your crew to deal in that environment with anything that goes wrong and to be able to put yourself in the safe configuration to get to the surface. You know, and that's not to mention all of the experiments that are going on that are, um, are legit. They're in parallel with whatever the space program's mission is at the time and implementing those in an undersea environment versus in space. And just every way, every way that we operate, and I know this is happening in all of the other analog missions as well, the idea is to operate in as much of a way as possible as you would in outer space somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's really important for astronauts to go through that process. Yeah. And the undersea thing, oh my gosh, aside from being the best analog there ever is, I think, you can't just walk out the door and swim <laughs> no. to the surface, right? Or float out the door and swim to the surface. You have to have special equipment and gone through special things to do that. But also the, I don't know, the on wonder factor is pretty high too. Yeah. You know, we joke that we get to go live and work in inner space to learn to live and work in outer space. Oh, and I love that. Oh, wow. Yeah, this perspective of the earth surrounding you versus you being the one surrounding it from outer space is oh, pretty so special cool. as well. Yeah. Oh, so cool. Yeah. Well, just like your book, our analog meeting is to really theme and find and symbolize out and collaborate on how the technologies we do on our analogs and how the technologies you accomplished and with your teammates in space help us in our everyday lives on earth. There's so many great examples in your book and we're really proud as an analog community that we can point to some and just be able to participate in some. 
if there were one or two that really stood out that you'd like to share, or if there's one you'd like to see that has not yet been done, or you'd love to invite an analog to try to accomplish anything that you'd like to share with one of those, <laughs> one of those experiments or technologies that was like, look, we did this and then back on earth, everyone appreciated. Well, I'll tell you, I, and this might be kind of the kumbaya answer. I don't know, you know, the kind of the overarching one and not pointing at anything in particular, but um, I really do believe that uh, all of what we're doing in space right now, um, and I use the International Space Station as this amazing example, is, is really and truly ultimately about improving life on earth, right? Yeah. And, and I looked, I mean, when I went to space the first time, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, our, our motto is off the earth for the earth. Okay. How really is that happening? And, and it was in everything. It was in the way we've built the space station. It was in the way we're doing all of the science on board that space station, um, where everything that's happening there has kind of this dual purpose. It's helping us live in that space environment, uh, you know, longer, better than we have before, more effectively, and you know, and, and in a healthier way. It's allowing us figure out how to explore further off our planet or to survive longer in that deadly vacuum of space. Yeah. But at the same time, everything about it, in one way or another, comes back to Earth and allows for us to improve the way we live here and share the planet with all the other life we share this planet with too. And, um, and I think the key one for me in all of that is we've decided to do that, right? We set up this mission of doing it. Um, and we didn't just do it as NASA here in the United States. We did it in partnership with 15 other countries, routinely with 15 other countries, five international space agencies. And that's a complex thing to do too, right? <laughs> to bring people from all over the world together. But it's just like this, to me, it's like this first step to how we just continue to do that yeah. for everything. And I love that the analog missions are taking on that, you know, more and more taking on that international cooperative yes. approach to how those are implemented as well. Mm -hmm. And recognizing yeah. that in those environments where we're learning about how to, even in an analog way, um, imagine and work in these places that are extreme. Uh, we can do that in partnership and learn more about how when we open the hatch and come out, you know, to the real world again here on uh -huh. earth, um, to carry those lessons with us. Yes. Oh, gosh. And I'm so well said, I wish we had the luxury of training together before <laughs> we step into our analogs, truly, because you have to yeah. become instant colleagues, instant friends, you have to get along, you have to work through the mission. And then when yeah. you're done, though, even though it was just for maybe weeks at a time, what an experience, a lifelong impression was made and friendship. So hopefully we're made and defined and we'll be celebrating that together at this conference as well. Just Absolutely. Like I know your crewmates have a special place in your heart as well. There is a question from one of the analog um, participants that I'd love to ask that was passed okay. along. Was there ever a time during your training or mission preparation, speaking of, that you felt like you didn't have the right stuff or suffered from imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you work through it? Wow. Um, was there ever not a time? Oh, really? <laughs> because, really? You know, I think it's true. I actually, and I think if you ask most people in, um, yeah, I, I think there would be, you know, maybe not every day, every second, that kind of thing. But I think there's always this, um, this wondering about ourselves, right? I mean, for me, it, you know, from even before applying to the astronaut office, um, you know, I grew up, watch the moon landing as a kid while wow, this is a, even then, you know, at six or seven, that's an extraordinary thing. I think it has an impact on you, whether you are actively carrying that forward or not. Um, I thought, man, that's so cool. People on the moon. Um, it seemed out of reach to me. It was like, wow, that's something other special people get to do. And that's the way I felt for a very long time until working at Kennedy Space Center and seeing what astronauts do, seeing that 99.9% .9 of their time is not flying in space, that a bulk of that, what they do do is, uh, did I just say that do do yeah. is um, <laughs> no, <it's okay. laughs> a lot like 
<laughs> what I was doing as a NASA engineer already. That gave me like, gave me this confidence to even think, oh, this could be perhaps a possibility. Um, but in all of these, these kind of self-doubt places along the way, even during training where I'm like, oh man, am I going to be strong enough to, to work in that 300 pound spacewalk and suit in the pool and get through it with a smile on my face? Um, am I going to be able to learn all of this technical information about all the different systems on the station and then be, uh, be a good crew member, you know, to my crewmates, am I going to be able to, and this is what I think through the analog missions comes out so beautifully. And it's why NASA uses them as well is it's really important to understand your own strengths and weaknesses yes. to accept that you have weaknesses, yeah. you know, and to know that to get through where you might be feeling like questioning yourself, that there's likely someone on your crew that's really good at that thing. Mm -hmm. And being willing to, you know, kind of wrap your arms around them and, and pull them in and use them so that you're successful. Um, that's scary to a lot of us, yeah. you know, to not think that we can, can't do everything. Right. But I think in all of it, to me, it was um, knowing that there's people that might know a little bit more about me than I do out there. These mentor -y kind of people that will encourage you to pick up the pen and fill out the application or will be there to lift you up and, uh, you know, maybe not solve the problem of you being able to do everything, but making you aware of what's available around you to help, help you be successful too. So, yeah. um, all those good people around me, I think that's where I really looked for the, um, the guidance to get through those self-doubty imposter kinds of oh, things. Oh, and thank, yes. Thank goodness for them, the friends, the colleagues, the mentors, Dr. Cyan Proctor yes. invited me once to do a Hawaii analog. And I thought to myself, I could never do that. And then I did it. And then you did it. <laughs> and you're like, okay, I, I can't believe I did that. And interestingly enough, I'm so glad you said this. There was a survey type in more like an invitation to write down your strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And they really encouraged you to be specific. And I was like, I am not a morning person. I will be up all night. Like I will do whatever it takes. I will all yeah. night through, through the night, but in the morning, maybe not so much. It was so good to put that down in writing and turn it in and just let it go and feel like right. it's there. And now if you, now you don't have to interpret, you don't have to wonder is Beth, why is she like, what's going on? <laughs> it's right there. Why she got and her nicest to us in the morning, you know, but if everybody knows that, right. If you just kept that to yourself, just kind of yeah, kind of hit it. And I think it's true. You mentioned something about having the opportunity to, to train with the crew you're with, you know, yeah. before you go. And you guys don't always have that with the analog mission. So more power to you, man, you know, for, for getting through it and being able to acknowledge each other's things, right. As you're, as, as it's happening versus having some clue to it before you get in there. I mean, that is one thing we're able to do is we train for years. I mean, the astronaut office cadre, even when you look at it internationally is pretty small. So you have some encounter along the way with pretty much anybody that you might fly with. And, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing. And it's, it, it's also when you're, when you don't know who those people are to have developed the skills along the way for and maybe that's what our spousal units or our family, our significant others are for is, okay, how, you know, how are we going to, how do we deal with them? And sometimes recognizing that we don't always use our best way with our family and knowing that we would need to do it a little differently right. <laughs> if we're on a cruise somewhere. Or yeah. maybe that's why your family sends you on an animal. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, honey. Go oh, ahead. No, you're good. I can eat an apple in the house now without, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh my that goodness. would be my husband. I, I wish we had all the more time that we had, but I know we have to uh, let you get back to your things. But, you know, one of the wonderful things we're going to be celebrating and enjoying during this conference is art. Art yes. in the form of our music and actual um, physical art, tangible art, all kinds of different types of art. So I really thank you for all the work you've done to encourage students and children and people of the world to celebrate their place in space that has and includes art. So we'll be thinking of you as we Aww. install and prepare and celebrate and enjoy our art. When we're doing these analogs, 
My last question is just when we are able to step away and just for a moment, it's so abbreviated, but it's still a part of our mission as much as the science and the research and all the mm -hmm. other ex experiences. When we find that personal thing, whether it's art, poetry, music, scenery, um, reading, whatever it is that helps us be human as we're in these environments, have any advice for us on how to enjoy, embrace, observe, or appreciate those moments? Well, yeah, I mean, I love that you guys uh, incorporate this just really right, right off the bat, incorporate it. I, you know, I like to think about it as putting the human in human space flight. And if we didn't think about doing that, you know, not just from the technical side of it, but, you know, the whole brain using our whole um, talent uh, as part of this, uh, I don't know why we send humans to space if we're not allowing the human in human space flight. Um, yeah. I think the best way you've, I mean, you already mentioned it is like just to allow yourself to do it, to open your heart, your mind to the people that are with you, to the environment you're in, to that little window you get to look out and, you know, experience that place from that perspective. And then if it's through music or photography or poetry or painting or whatever it might be that you want to like in a special way, capture it, that you do it that you just absolutely acknowledge it and, and do it. And um, I don't think there's anything, <laughs> any, anything else to say about it other than I think we need to do those kinds of things. Yeah. Put it into the mission plan, yeah. make the time to make sure that we're celebrating, encouraging, being artistic. Wonderful. Oh, Nicole, yeah. thank you so much. You're welcome. I really appreciate that you've taken the time to share with us. And I know that everyone will probably still have questions. And I know everyone is enjoying your book so much. So if thank you. Well, oh, thank you. <laughs> it's such a treasure of your stories and experiences. And of course, Nicole, the first thing I do, I open the book and you're already giving kudos to your crewmates and to Serena well, and all the, I mean, it's like, yes. And I want to hear about Nicole's time too. So just, <laughs> you're just so gracious. Thank you again Thank so you. much. And please come to our next in-person event. I would love to. And thanks for including me even virtually. Love it. Awesome. All right. Well, that is how I'm going to pause it.